Are you a fan of horror movies? Necronomicon Ex Mortis. The Book of the Dead. What about cult classics? Your move, creep. If you are, you'll love shocking things. Please search for us on all the major podcasting platforms. To see our social media and a direct link to our podcast, just go to anchor.fm slash shocking things. Superstar and New England Pro Wrestling Hall of Famer Mario Mancini. How are you, sir? Good, brother. How are you? I'm awesome, dude. I'm very glad to uh, be sitting here with you. It's something I wanted to do for a very, very long time. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, first, basically, I just want to ask you some questions about your career, and then we can find out what you're doing today. Sure. Is that cool? All right. Tell me. So I know that uh, you grew up during the 70s, which was possibly one of the greatest eras of professional wrestling, and you were a big, big excuse me, Bruno San Martino fan. Yes. And then you met Tony Altamore, correct? I did. So how, tell me about that, how you ended up uh, meeting him and getting well, him to train. In 1980, um, you know, wrestling only came on at midnight, and... Uh, mm-hmm. I was sitting there watching it, and um, Vince McMahon popped on in an empty arena with Bruno San Martino, and I was 14 years old, and he basically said, Bruno, you have something to tell everybody, and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm retiring. I'm all done, and I was extremely upset, and I had five other siblings and my mother and father in the, in the living room, and um, I said, I'm going to be a professional wrestler. I said, I'm going to be a pro wrestler for the WWWF. And, um, you know, they thought I was nuts. And I said, no, I'm, I'm going to take Bruno's spot. I'm going to take, I'm going to replace Bruno. It didn't, it didn't, it ended up that I, I replaced Frank Williams, not Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that name. I got an old, uh, I got an old program recently. I collect a lot of programs and magazines. And they were talking about young up and comers, and Frankie Williams was one of the guys that was featured. Like he was gonna, you know, uh, predicting the big stars of the future. So I have to tell you, which which is the exact same that thing that happened to me, because um, when I started doing house shows, um, you know, I'd be walking out to my car and fan, I'd meet, I'd greet fans, and they go, "Wow, you can wrestle." You know, mm-hmm. I'd be like, thank you so much, you, you know, because house shows, thank God you get 50-50, right? Mm-hmm. But on TV, you know, if you got up to get something to drink, you missed my match. So, and, and um, you know, that that happened with me with Frank Williams because I, as I sat there in, you know, 1982 in the New Haven Coliseum, you know, he was the first match out. And I went, oh, jeez. You know what I mean? Because I was used to seeing him get killed in two and a half mm-hmm. minutes on TV. Mm-hmm. And he had like a 15-minute match, and he was an excellent wrestler. Yeah. He's yeah. an excellent wrestler. So he was an excellent worker. So, it, you know, um, you know, I have a lot of respect for him. And, um, you know, like I said, though, it, 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 so I, I, in one of those New Haven shows in 1983, a guy, guy got in the ring to be a referee. And I was there with my family and my mom and dad at, you know, the, the, the second row. And, you know, I was born and raised till I was 10 years old in Stanford, Connecticut. But my mother and father were born in Stanford, Connecticut, and um, went to grammar school with Tony Altamar. Huh. This, this I didn't know. So when he got in the ring... My father stood up and said, Tony, hey, Tony, you know, and he looked back and he said, hey, Ralph, Gloria, how you doing? I go, you know that guy? <laughs> so I, I ended up following him around for a couple of months until he gave in and he let me come to the New Haven Coliseum a couple of months later uh, in the afternoon when the ring was up. And 
Uh, that's when I saw who would end up being a very close brother of mine, Seth Cohen, who worked uh, as Robbie Parliament in the WWF. Okay. Um, he was there getting drop kicked um, from the top rope by Kurt Henning. This was, was, this was in 80, yeah. 83. His first run there. Yeah. Right, yeah. And yeah. Kurt just kept going to the top and drop kick. Fuji was showing him how to drop kick off the top rope. And, um, you know, I went there and did some stuff. And then he said, you know, I'm, I'm opening up a wrestling school in October in Orange at a gym called Pastorello's Quest. So that, you know, that's that's where I went. Seth was there. And, um, you know, and, you know, Dave Barbie showed up, AJ Petrucci. I remember those uh, names. And a few months later, uh, you know, Roma showed up. And, um, you know, the rest is history. Rita Marie showed up. Uh, Rita Rita's going to be at Diesel Mania. Okay, cool. She's, she's coming down. Um, uh, she showed up, and then Ted Arcidi showed up, and JT Southern showed up. And then Steve Blackman showed up, and then Russ Greenberg showed up, and um, Mark Thomas, then, you know, Paul Perez showed up, and um, Dave Paradise showed up, Big Steve, and um, and this is all between, like, 84 and 88, and, um, yeah, well, I, I got done with wrestling school July 31st of 84, six weeks after I graduated from high school. Um, and six weeks after I turned 18 and at July 31st at the Poughkeepsie Mid Hudson Civic Center, I turned pro against Greg Valentine. I was going to ask you about that. Um, how was that? That being your first match being, uh, did you have say first match jitters working in front of a, a large crowd? Well, you know, the funny part, it, Valentine loves this story. It's one of his favorite stories. And I told it at a, um, very intimate question and answer session when I got inducted into the New England Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame in 2014. And I remember it step by step, Rick, because in AJ Petrucci um, will confirm the story to be true. So when we were in wrestling school, we were friends. So we were told that we're sparring. And we're only sparring because we're training, but when we turn pro, we're really going to apply this stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we believe that. So when I got accepted by the WWF, I was told to go down the stairs and sign my contract with Gorilla Monsoon. And I did. And I met Chief Jay Strongbow for the first time, who became my second father for 28 years. And I said, Mr. Strongbow, what would you like me to do? He said, see that chair? Sit down and shut up. So I sat there and kept my mouth shut. I didn't move. Meanwhile, inside of me, while I'm watching S.D. Jones walk by and Tito Santana and Craig Valentine and Don Morocco and Darren Sheik and Volkoff. And, you know, I was just, you know, it was my first mm -hmm. day there. So I, I, I tried, you know, I did a good job keeping a poker face like, hey, I belong right. there. You know, but I was freaking out, you know. Oh, yeah. And when I saw Bruno, for forget it. I had to really keep myself under control. So, um, Little time went by, and uh, I looked up at the board, and I saw my name up there spelled wrong against Valentine. So I went up to Strongbow, and I said, Mr. Strongbow, just what? I said, you, sp you spelled my name wrong on the board. And he goes, you, you really think that makes a difference? You really think that makes a difference? I go, it does to me. He goes, sit down and shut up. Wow. So now Altamar came walking in, and Chief called me over. And he said, go talk to Valentine. I said, why? I'm wrestling him. I don't want to talk to him. And he kind of gave a glance over at Tony. Tony kind of did a, did a mm. 
I said, Mr. Strongbow, is this a title match or a non-title match? Because he was the Intercontinental Champion. I said, because I'm going to beat him. I'm going to, I'll beat him. I'm going to beat him. And Strongbow looked over at Altamar and Tony, I heard Tony grunting. <laughs> so now it was time to expose the business. So he puts his arm around me and we walk in the corner. He goes, listen, go, just go talk to Valentine. I said, T, I don't want to talk to him. He goes, listen, kid, let's go talk to Valentine. So I went over to him. I go, I am Mario Mancini. He goes, <laughs> so I'm wrestling. I'm, I'm not, we're working together. I'm wrestling you. Right. He goes, uh, just keep your legs as loose as possible, like spaghetti, he said, because if they're stiff, you're going to hurt yourself. I'm not going to hurt you. And I just stared on it. And inside, I went, oh, no, it can't be. It can't be. Right. <laughs> so that split second, I had to accept it that split second. So I accepted it. And I said, do I, do, do I get a comeback? He said, absolutely. I said, what can I do? He said, after you submit to the figure four, get off the canvas and come back to the dressing room. <laughs> and I said, okay. So I went out there and um, I did the job. Before we went out there, we were on the top steps behind the, the big metal doors in Poughkeepsie. And uh, Tony Altamar was in the gorilla position. And I was standing on uh, it, behind the door. It was me, Lou Albano, and Valentine. And Altamar was seated. And Valentine looked over at me and went, how many matches have you had? I said, this is my first professional match ever. And he did a lurch, you know, from the Adams family. He just, Ugh. <laughs> and Albano started laughing. So you'll be all right, kid. You'll be all right. And uh, Altamar took the, you know, thing away from his mouth. And he said, listen, he goes, no rib. This kid's good. And Valentine just gave him a nod. And we went out there and. I did what I had to do. I, I it, you know, I sold the daylights out of the figure four. I mean, if you, you have more capabilities than I do, it's, it's either wrestling challenge or superstars of wrestling, but the air date is eight eighteen eighty four. I think I came across it today. Somebody made a compilation uh, where they put like an hour's worth of your matches together. Yeah, and I think it's like I think it's like one of the earliest ones on that 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 thing. Yeah, it's eight eighteen eighty four, and um, I think even Valentine was a little thrown back how I sold that figure for me. <laughs> um, you know, because I didn't want anybody. As I saw as my career went on, the first two years, uh, there were plenty of guys that went out there once. And they were never asked to come back, and they never came back. And I, I didn't want to be – I wanted to stay, and I, I, I just signed a contract. Um, you know, so it, – it, but it wasn't the same contract that Hogan signed. Uh, it was just a contract that said that Vince McMahon owned my name, Lock, Stock, and Barrel. Okay. And I would never be paid less than $50 for a wrestling match. Oh my God! Right, so um, but it was 1984, though. So right. I mean, it's a little bit better than today's standards. Uh, all right, so <laughs> um, you know, my second match was in um, West Warwick, Rhode Island, August 9th, 1984, at the West Warwick Music Theater that isn't there anymore. And I worked with uh, David Schultz that night, and he broke my nose in two places. Oh my God. Just a hazing in the professional wrestling. Just, oh. you know. But he thought I was a local yokel from okay. from Rhode Island. He thought I was some sort of villain. And then two days later, I, you know, I got it reset and I was on the couch and I got a call. And, and they had called because David just lived in Woodbridge. Yep. They, had, they had called him down to the office in, in, Stan, in Greenwich at the time on Arch Street. Such a tiny building. I wish 
uh, you know, I'll show it to you someday. Had three floors. Um, my mother, my mother answered the phone and she goes, Dr. D's on the phone. So I got up and got the phone and I, I said, hello. And he said, Hey boy, how you doing? I said, okay. How's your nose, man? He said, it's okay. He goes, uh, your, your face got kind of way in my fist. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, three weeks later, they put me on TV with them in Hamilton, Ontario. And, um, I, I, you know, I knew that was a test and I knew if I took my boots off or I told one person I refused to work with them, then I didn't belong there. Right. So, so I just went into a stall and got my gumption up and, you know, I went up to him. I said, you can break it again if you want. I really don't care. And now, now, boy, he goes, now, now, he goes, I'll tell you what. I'm going to apologize to you on national TV. Now you got to remember I'm 18. Year, I'm a new 18 year old. So I go, really? Oh yeah, boy. I'm, I, I'm sorry. I broke your nose. I'm going to, I'm going to apologize to you on national TV. I go, okay. This is on YouTube. So I get in the ring and he's in the ring and the bell starts for the match to start. And sure enough, he comes up to me and he shakes my hand and he goes, sorry for breaking your nose. And he smacked me dead across my face. Did he break it again? No. No. (laughs) No. But I tell you what, it was a good TV match. It was great. And I'm happy to say that I have a lot of love in my heart for uh, Dr. D. David Schultz today. Um. You know, we we talk, we text on occasion. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, it, awesome. it, it, he's a very, he's a very nice man. He's a he's mm-hmm. a he's a gentleman. Um, he's a great husband. He's a great father. He's just a good human being, and um, and not a lot of people know that because Doc, you know Doc doesn't want a lot of people to know that. <laughs> Um, good because he's dr d but he, he is- kept that character like outside um one of the things i want to mention before you can continue was like i grew up in woodbridge when he lived there so and there was a gas station down the street from my road that had pictures of him hanging up in there because he because he lived in the town they were all excited so if yeah. it was right right off exit 59 off uh route 15 that gas station that was there yeah he so. he uh we we text every now and then, you know what I mean. He'll come in and say how you doing and everything, and and I'll you know, you know I always hope he's doing okay. And mm-hmm. um, you know the man the man did me the biggest favor of my life because, um, you know, guys in my position don't hang around too long, mm-hmm. and I was fortunate be there from 1984 from july of 84 to april of 92 um and schultz breaking my nose so soon and me coming back to work with him again you know gave me gave me some respect because (laughs) as david schultz told that cameraman before before he hit him he said, because this is a tough business. That's why you ain't in it. And this guy holding the camera, he ain't in it because it's a tough business. And I, I proved that I can be tough in it. I mean, after that, I was in Battle Royals where I got chopped by everyone. I, I got chopped so badly um, one night in a Battle Royal, my chest was bleeding down my stomach, down to my knee, down, down to my knee pads. And after the first year, it it was over, um, and I got, you know, everybody was very light with me because they think Strongbow went around and said, you know, the kid paid his dues and he 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 got his break in and and everything, and and David started that for me <laughs> by breaking my nose, <laughs> so I'm glad he did it. I got it over with early, and he's the one that did it, and. Um, you know, he he saved me probably a lot more beatings in in the future because everybody knew that Schultz broke my nose. Right. Um, 
but I'm I'm thankful for him uh, breaking my nose. He he eventually ended up coming in Quest and having his own wrestling school. I I did shoot with him a few times in the school, and I I just would never shoot with him again because <laughs> let me tell you something. David Schultz could wrestle. David Schultz taught me that I could just put my elbow on somebody's back Mm -hmm. and they can't move. David Schultz taught me that I can just put my chin in a place on somebody's back and they can't move. You know what I mean? And, you know, he taught, he, those few, very few times I went in there with him, I learned a lot. It hurt. It, it was almost a Stu Hart style of, of shooting. It, it, it wasn't fun, but I did it and I went through it. And he, he taught me a lot those two or three times I went in there. And then he'd be having his class and I'd be there working out. And he'd go, hey, Nancy, why don't you come on in? I go, no thanks, Doc. You know, so, he taught me. so um, but, you know, he taught me a lot. And, and you know, one thing about David is, is he, he is a tough guy. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he is a tough son of a bitch to this day. Um, you know, I don't care how old he is. If, you know what? If he said, man, see, I'm a, I'm gonna beat your ass. You'd see one fat guy start running fast. You know what I mean? Because he, David Schultz truly is. He's, he's a man's man. He's tough. Listen, I saw Schultz in Poughkeepsie in the dressing room, shooting with Hulk Hogan on the rug on the carpet, on top of him, and Hogan going, Did, let me go, let me go, let me go, let me go, because he had him, and he wouldn't let him go. Hogan couldn't move. I saw that with my own eyes. I saw it with my own eyes. Um, so David Schultz is one of my, my favorite people. You know, God bless him. And, uh, you know, God bless his family. I, I don't even mention him by name because that's not even David Schultz. But I, I know their names. I'm just going to say God bless them because he'll, he'll text me and go, boy, you say the name of my wife and kid on them. You know what I mean? So, you know, God bless him and his family. And, um, you know, I hope he always does well. Um, he was an extreme talent in this wrestling business. Um he could have rivaled any heel in the business ever for a long period of time. And he got screwed. He did. He uh. got screwed. But in, in, you know, in the true spirit of David Schultz, you know, he, he picked up another profession by bounty hunting and, you know what? Probably made more money doing that than he did in the wrestling business, and, and and a lot of times he got to sleep home in his bed. So, God bless him and good for him. I love I love David Schultz, one of my 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 favorite people. I'm glad I was able to see him before the pandemic. I think it was 2018 in New Jersey, and um, you know that's when his book came out. I think right around yeah, that time. That's when his, that's when his book yep. came out, and and you know if David Schultz. You're on the phone with David Schultz. Says, "Hey, boy, come up to my room. This is my room number. That means you're his friend, man, because he doesn't do that." So, um, you know, of course, every time I see him in person, I cover my nose with my left hand, and I got my right hand out to shake his hand. You know, and he starts laughing. You know, but um, he, you know, he, he's very dear to me. David Schultz means a lot to me. So, um, hope he defended you know. he defended the business for years and years and years. After, you know, I guess it had kind of been exposed on like Morton Downey, stuff like that. And he went nuts. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I consider the John Stossel thing to me that personally, I thought that was like the greatest moment in professional wrestling history. And and I got news for you, Rex. So did the boys. So did yeah. so did every single one of them because he was protecting the business. Yeah, absolutely. He's He's the one that took the step to do it. And you know what? He was told to do it. Yeah, and then by, things by the man himself. He said, "If this guy gives you any stuff, let him have it." And David said, "Do you have my back?" And he said, "Yes." He came up to him and he said, "I think it's fake. You think it's fake?" Boom, boom, and nobody had his back. 
everybody turned on him and that was that was the end of that and uh you know were you there for that did you see that happen i did no i did not see that strangely enough where i even shocked myself this is ridiculous one day i i just i was on youtube and i decided to watch the birth of of hulkamania and Sheik was thrown out of the ring after the match. And I saw myself grab him around the shoulders. And I went, <laughs> I was there. You don't it, remember. Listen, it was the most eerie feeling in my life. And I remember everything. As you can tell, I got dates and everything. Yeah, yeah. I can could, I could remember everything. And I didn't remember that. And I said, that was January of 84, seven months before I broke in. And then I was there for the war to settle the score, uh, holding back Piper. And um, I, you know, I was I was very um, I was very fortunate to, uh, you know, I have to thank Tony Altamar because he's the one that would always say, "Kid, come on, you want to go to the garden?" And uh, after I turned pro, one of those times when he said, "Hey, kid, come on, you want to go to the garden?" Vince McMahon said, "Get dressed. I need you." I said. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, who am I working? Who am I working with? Tony Atlas. I go. Okay. You know. So um, I was I was very fortunate uh, to have Tony Altamar there for me. Unfortunately, you know, we had a falling out in '89, and that's when the owner of the gym said, "Listen, either you're going to take over the wrestling school, or I'm selling the ring and putting more equipment there." And I said, "No, no, no. I'll take it." So at the age of 23 years old in 1989 is when I actually started teaching a wrestling school. I remember uh, hearing about that when I was, I remember hearing about it when I was younger, like my uncle would tell me about it. Yeah. So, um, I, I did it until 92. Mm-hmm. They, they sold the gym. I really didn't get along with the new owner. And then, uh, Roma came in briefly, but then he got a call from the WCW and he went there. So and I think they just turned it into a boxing school or something, but yeah, I think uh, they moved to, moved to West Haven as well. Right. Ray Ryan Campbell yeah. Avenue. And yeah. uh, every now and then I take my kids there. It's a, it's a Taekwondo studio and uh, gotcha. we peek through the door and I show them where the ring was. And the only thing I regret with, with Kenny Passarello is, um, there was a wall. Mm-hmm. Uh, behind the ring and it, it was the wall of fame and I signed it and AJ Petrucci signed it Dave Barbie, Seth signed it and then the WWF came in to do a promo for Hogan training Hillbilly Jim and yes. Ho- then Ho- yeah, Hogan, Hogan signed it Hillbilly Jim signed it Vince McMahon signed it Mean Gene Oakland signed it and um you know then the guys came in and trained and greg valentine signed it and well i just wish i knew that was happening because i would have went there with a sheetrock cutter and cut that square right out but right you know it's it's gone <laughs> wow that's terrible that's yeah i sound it'd be like a that'd be a really great collector's piece for especially today like uh you know it's a golden age collect like that era of uh professional wrestling collectibles it's like people are going crazy for these days well, yeah so you know uh let's see what else do i have here so let's see all right i already we already talked about valentine what was it like you worked the first matches for guys like king kong bundy and heart foundation and of course obviously the undertaker so how, what was it like working with these gentlemen well i gotta tell you um march of 85 mm-hmm I walk into Poughkeepsie now, like I've been there for 10 years and I've started a relationship with, with Strongbow, you know, uh, Tony Altamar gave me a secret. He goes, if you go to a house show and Strongbow's the agent, always have a sausage and pepper sub for him. <laughs> so I'd walk in with a sausage and pepper sub and go, chief, this is, you got this for me. I go, yeah, it's for you. Cause chief is Italian, you know? Yep. So I walk in there. Bundy is in a pair of white, what do you call those? Uh, white slip-on sneakers. What do you call those? Like uh, boat shoes or something? Kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. A pair of jeans 
in a Fruit of Loom t-shirt. And I look up at the board and it says Bundy V. Mancini. And I look over at him and he's like this. So I walk over and I go, Bundy? He goes, Chris. I go, I'm Mario Mancini. I'm, I'm working with you. Strongbow walks over and he goes, Chris, I, I put you one of the best guys we have. He's going to get you over big. And he walked away. And I saw the size of this guy. And I said to myself, either he's going to work with me or he's going to kill me. <laughs> and I said, Chris, listen to me. I'm going to sell for you hard. I know what to do. I said, you know, you just push me off. I said, I'll grab your leg, bring it back, throw it up. I'll go flying. I said, a tackle. I'll take a bump off a tackle. Big guy stuff, you know. I said, if you can picture the grand finale at a 4th of July <laughs> firework display, that's what I'm going to sell. Like. <laughs> I said, Chris, listen to me. You don't have to kill me. I'm going to sell for you. He said, okay. He goes, you know, I, I had your job here a few years ago. I was a jobber here. <laughs> and um, Chris Pallelis. So he was, he was a jobber there. And he had long hair. Long hair. I did see him with hair uh, when he wrestled in Texas. Uh, he, he had a different name. I'm trying. I can't remember right at this present moment, though. I don't remember. I don't know. Something. It was I something. Know, Bundy, I don't know if it was Chris Cannon or I don't know. But yeah, I don't remember. So we got in there, and he was stiff as a board. Oh my god. And he leaned me in that back of that top rope and he brought that farm down. I went, oh, God. <laughs> and he was just another guy I became very close to. Um, worked a house show with him in 1999 um, for another company. And I got there, big hug. And he said, I said, we're, we're working tonight. Would that be the NAWA? Is that what yeah. you're yeah. yeah, okay. I remember. I, said, I remember him working there. Yeah. And he said, and I'm putting you over for what you did for me in New York. He goes, just move on the splash, the avalanche, and just cover me. I said, that's not happening. <laughs> he goes, I. this is your payback for what you did for me in New York. Because I worked with him several times. One was a stretcher. I said, I want to put aside the friendship. Let's look at us like comic book characters. Underdog doesn't beat the Incredible Hulk. I said, Mario Mancini does not go over on King Kong Bundy. It just doesn't happen. That's not the character. Right. He goes, why do you have to have such a hard head? I said, well, just go out there and heal it up. I'll take care of the rest. Right. So now he comes back after intermission, and he looks at me, and he goes, I need to talk to you. I go, yeah. He goes, uh, I went out for intermission. I went, uh-huh. Sold a lot of 8 by 10s met a lot of people, cracked a lot of jokes. I go, I'm the heel. He goes, uh, yeah. I go, I'm the heel. You're the baby face. <laughs> and I'm the heel. He said, uh, yeah. I said, uh, okay. <laughs> So we went out there and Bundy came out and he grabbed the microphone and he said, hey, Mancini, if I poked you in your stomach, would you go, hey? <laughs> and I kicked the bottom rope and I started going crazy. And, uh, you know, I did, when I'm a heel, I, I do my best Don Morocco I can do. Because to me, you know, Don Morocco was a great heel. So I try to do, when I'm a heel, any match I was ever a heel, I tape my wrist, tape my fingers, you know. I did do that 10 minutes to two walk, you know. And I right. did my, I did the best Morocco I can do. I got picked off a couple times by the guys in the dressing room. and said, that was Morocco. And I go, you bet your ass it was. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, except for one match at the Mohegan Sun I, I, against Gibbs, I, I tried to figure out who I could copy to get this over because at my age, the storyline of the match would have to be bigger than the wrestling moves because I'm an old man. So I thought of Baron Miguel Cicluna, how he would beg for his life in the ring and just <laughs> cheap shot the guy all the time. And God bless Paul Perez. The second I went back to the rest, the dressing room, he looked at me, he goes, you just robbed Cicluna. And I went, he knew that. Perez, are you kidding me? He goes, that was Baron Miguel Cicluna. I said, it absolutely was. So, <laughs> Wow. So, uh, yeah, Perez picked me off, man. It was amazing. Um, He's got a big knowledge, too. His whole family was involved in the uh, Yeah, more than fresh him, man. And, and he, always, he always shakes his head no, you know. Uh -huh. um, he had the fastest pirouette elbow I've ever seen anybody drop. He was just a master in the ring, man. He was just such a great mechanic, a great wrestler. Uh -huh. He was, he was, he was a lot better than I was. And he'd always, oh no, I like it. Press, you're a great wrestler. He's, he's humble. Yeah. But, you know, he wasn't around too long, though, right? I think he was around maybe from 80, late 88, early 89 to like 91. Okay. Yeah. I know he, he wrestled elsewhere, though, right? Did he? Yeah. Press yeah. did a lot. Press did a lot of wrestling. I remember when he first came into the wrestling school and, you know, I did to him what I did to everybody. But yeah, okay, let's see what we got. Yeah. And we got in the ring and I started calling everything. And he just started doing everything. And he started doing everything and it was 100% right. And when I got done with him after a half hour, we we're sitting on the apron. I go, you want to go to TV? And he went, it, <laughs> last press style. He goes, okay. And I That relaxed. Oh, Chief loved him. Strong really? loved Perez. He loved Perez. Because Perez never said a damn thing. Never. 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 You could never get anything out of Perez. Nothing. That's why at Paradise Alley, our, our saying is this. If Perez has something to say, something has to be wrong. Right. Because Perez doesn't say anything. Wow. Yeah, he doesn't. Really, you know, uh, he's very friendly gentleman. He'll yeah. And say, Hello, but it's not a lengthy conversation. <laughs> you know. Yeah. What I mean? Yeah. So. Again, again, one of my closest brothers in the business, man. He's just, I love Perez. He, you know, I love Perez. So you appeared on uh, you Roma and Steve Lombardi all appeared on uh, Tuesday Night Titans as the unsung heroes. Tell me what that was like. You had only been in the business a few months, I believe. Right? Uh, yeah, it was frustrating after it was done because, um, you know, Lombardi was feeding a lot of heel lines. And at one mm -hmm. point, I look, it, which you don't see on the show. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it, but I, you know, I, you know, I, I at one point, they must have edited it because at one point I said, you know, you got a big mouth. You know what I mean? So. We were done with it, and Vince said, gee, I'm sorry the set stayed together. And I said to myself, ah, damn, if I knew he wanted us to destroy the set, I would have done that. Um, I feel like I missed an opportunity, but, um, you know, um, you, know Lum Lum you know, Lombardi got his big push by receiving a big push, and I wasn't doing that. So... Um, I've heard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't right. doing that. I, I you know, I, and I, I don't, I don't uh, condemn people if, if it's that, if it's their choice. I, I say mm -hmm. it in the nature of whether it's a man or a woman. You know, mm -hmm. what I mean, if, if you sleep your way to the top, and Lombardi, I would say, barely made it to the top. Uh, I mean, making it to the top is is getting a run with Hogan, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just, you know, when he got that torn sweatshirt and that cap, you know, I took Strongbow in the corner and I was livid, livid, livid. I said, I can't work his way to a wet paper bag. I go, he looked, he looks clumsy. He's, he's not, I go, I, you know, he's like. He you stayed there a long time though. He was well, there a long, long time. Years. Yeah, he's a millionaire. Yeah. He's a millionaire. Yeah. Oh, so. Wow. So Chief said, you want to do what he did? We can set that up for you. 
I said, no, I'll keep, I'll keep losing. I'm not doing that. He goes, all right, then. And he gave me the 84 line. He said, all right, then sit down and shut up. You know? Um, I wasn't going to bring that up, but what was it like? Was it, was it, there like tension like that in the, in the locker room because of situations with uh, that individual? It's not, see, the old WWF back in the 80s, it wasn't tension. Mm -hmm. It was worse. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew. So everybody would make fun of him, Mm -hmm. especially Joey Morella. You know, who the Rip. referee, Monsoon's kid. Oh, my God. The impression he did of Lombardi was spot on. Spot on. And, it, you know, Rick, it was bad because he would ref some of my matches on TV. And he would look down as the fans are, are there and watching on TV and they're live. They think the referee's looking down to see if I'm okay. Meanwhile, Morella bends over and looks me face to face. Nobody could see his face. And he, he just... He was kind of like Jim Carrey with his face. He just put the Lombardi face on and started going like this. And I, I, I was sell, I was still selling on the canvas. And when I sold, I had to go like this when I was selling because I just started laughing. Um, but I, you know, even speaking to Bull James when we we booked him for Diesel Mania, I, I said Lombardi's name. He said, "Listen, don't ever let me catch him on the street." And that's when myself and Bull James bonded. <laughs> wow. I mean, he was let go after 30 years. I think was the uh, yeah he was story came out. Yeah, yeah, he was he was he was let go. But you know, I spoke to I, I, I don't want to get any heat on any guys, especially this guy because he's not a heat kind of guy. Mm-hmm. But I did some uh, autograph sessions, um, mm-hmm. and I spoke to one of the guys, and he said, "Yeah, that son of a bitch is a millionaire, Mario. He saved his money." And he was there for 30 years, man. He saved his money. So um, I, I'm just happy I don't see him much on the independent circuit. Um, he's, living out, he's living out west now, I think, or in the Midwest or something to that effect. So. Well, that, that's good. That's where he can stay. You know? Yeah. So um, listen, Terry Garvin and, and Pat Patterson were, were the same way, but I got to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. I didn't know Terry Garvin was. I was very close to Terry Garvin. Um, he loved me. I'd walk in the dressing room and go, Mario, quesadilla. You know what I mean? He just really, really good friends with Terry Carvin. And he's the one that booked me the m- mostly because mm-hmm. um, he was the assistant booker. And um, I was never, he had a wife and a couple kids, and, and I was never aware because he was never out of sorts with me. In fact, Pat Patterson was never out of sorts with me. Um, one, one day in 1990 in New, in New Haven, when I was, when I was getting frustrated, I talked to Pat, you know, and I said, listen, I, I put my time in here. I've been here six years. I paid my dues. I go, it, can I get something? You know, he goes, Mario, I like you. The office likes you just be patient. And that was the line. Mm-hmm. That was the famous line. They always say that through the years. I like you, the office likes you, be patient. And at that particular time, that was like the sixth or seventh time it was said to me. So I got a little frustrated while he walked away, and I said, what's the matter? My ass isn't cute enough for you. (laughs) And he turned around. He goes, what did you say to me? I said, nothing. He goes, no, 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 Mario, what did you say? I said, Pat, I didn't say anything. He goes, you bet you didn't say anything. I said, no, I didn't say nothing. And I ran the strongbow because I thought at that point, you know, I was done. But yeah, uh, you know, strong by what he, he, would, he would never let that happen, right? In fact, I walked away. Um, you know, a lot of people that I do interviews with, they're like, Wow, you know, good for you. Not a lot of people got to do that. So, April 26, 1992, I was in Huntsville, Alabama, and I worked with Rick Rude. So, um I walked up to the chief and I said, I, I can't take it anymore. I'm going to be 26 in two months. What do I do? He goes, I can't even get my own kid booked. And when he told me that, it hit me so hard because. You know, it's, uh, Vincent Young, right? Or Mark Young? Was Mark that Young. Yeah. yeah. It, yep. it, it, it hit me so hard mm-hmm. when he said that. 
and Mark was a great worker. I um, thought so, yeah. That hit me so hard. It just really, really hit me between the eyes. And I went home and I looked at my mother and said, um, I'm done. She goes, you're done. I said, I'm, I'm done. And the next day the phone rang and she answered the phone, put the receiver to her chest. She said, it's Terry Hart. I said, not home. And she said, I'm, I'm sorry, Terry's not home. And he said, okay. And the phone never rang again. Ever. So I just, I left. And, and it makes sense because I'm glad I didn't stay because it would have been really insulting to me by 1994 when they faded all of the jo jobbers out. They were done. Right. And, and that attitude era started. Um, so. And now they try to bring, you know, one preliminary match probably every month or whatever like that. You know what I mean? To try to bring, when they bring in new talent, they just bring in some local guy to get the shit kicked out of them, basically. So it's not, you know, they try to bring it back. It just, it doesn't work. But you didn't have the option to try to go anywhere else, like WCW or anything like that? Well, again, another one of my brothers who every now and then I have to sit and listen and get lectured and yelled at, uh, which is Big Daddy. Mm-hmm. And because he's convinced that I could have went to the WCW, he's more than that. He's convinced that I could have made an incredible run on the independent circuit if what I about, put myself if I put myself out there. What about Japan too? I mean, a lot of guys yeah. went to Japan. Yeah, you know, I just I found out that I I I couldn't. My chin was dropped. I was popular in Japan. Um. When I first did the New England Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame in 2013, Joe Bruin called me to do it, and I declined. He said, I'm not doing it. He goes, why? I, go, I just don't want to do it. I never did them, and I don't want to do them. He goes, but why? I said, listen, it, I have my own reasons. Mm -hmm. he, goes, he goes, I have a guy coming all the way from Japan just to meet you. I said, why would you commit me when I haven't said yes? I go, I'm sorry, he's coming all the way from Japan. And I, he said, could you at least just tell me why you don't want to do it? I said, because if I sit there for seven hours and sign two autographs, I'm going to be mortified that I just was nothing. He said, Mario, that's not going to happen. I go, it, it could. He goes, it's not going to happen. You've never done a, a, a wrestling convention. He goes, you've never done an autograph session. You're nostalgic people will go nuts if they see you and i said okay i'll do it and thank god he was right um because people literally were going by my booth going holy shit mario you know so i was married at the time and my my wife was with me and she kind of poked my shoulder and said there's a very confused oriental guy in the middle of the ballroom and he was just standing there and then he spotted me and he did a beeline right to me and he started yelling seven feet away from me mancini 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 i said hi he goes i'm shu i'm shu i said how you doing she goes i come from japan to see you i said well i really appreciate it. he goes how come you never come to japan we want to see you in Japan. I go, I'm sorry. I never got there. So, um, unfortunately, Shu passed away at a very young age. In fact, the day after he got home from the wrestling convention in 2015, I think it was, he, the plane landed, he went home, and he just passed away from a heart attack. It was terrible. Um, yeah, it was terrible. Joe Bruin and I were all <clears throat> busted, up, busted up, but um, so Big Daddy, you know, believes that if I really was aggressive with the the independent circuit, I would have done really well and still traveled a lot and and really did a lot of independent stuff. 
when I got out in 92, to be honest with you, I was so heartbroken. I, uh, yeah. I, w- I was so heartbroken that my answer to people after a year or two that I wasn't wrestling anymore, nor watching it, said, I don't, you know, you can wrestle other places. I said, listen, <laughs> I played for the New York Yankees, and now you want me to play for the Mississippi Mudslingers. <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. You, you know, I think it was the experience SD and I got. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes Kowalski would lease us out. Mm-hmm. From w- Kowalski would call the office and say, we need some talent. Mm-hmm. And Musky Sala would do that. And we would go to these independent shows. And w- when we walked into the dressing room, we got a little bit of an attitude. Um. And sometimes it would be me, SD, Iron Mike Sharp, maybe Leap and Lanny Poffo. But we'd get a little, we sat by ourselves in the corner of the dressing room by ourselves, separate from the independent guys. There were some nice independent guys would come up and talk and go, hey, how is it there? You know, how, you know, um, how's it feel to be there and stuff like that? A couple of them, not a lot, but most of them had the attitude of, well, you think you're better than me because you're with the WWF, you know? So I didn't have good experiences in independent dressing rooms when I was with the WWF and we got reached out. Um, So I, I just, I just didn't bother um, until 1999. I I was out for seven years, nothing to do with it. And then I I worked, I wasn't even going to do that show, but it was with Bundy. And um, then in 2007, I started doing some stuff with Tukey Tucker that lasted about a year. And then Vin the Chin called me and wanted me to train him and put a ring in his backyard. <laughs> and he and his parents put on some shows at Melillo, and I worked with him a couple times. Um, and then in 2014, I opened up Par- Paradise Alley. And, you know, big, me, Big Steve, Roma, and then... You know, after a few months, you know, you put a wrestling ring up, Perez will sniff it out. So he came walking through the door. <laughs> yeah, he, he came walking through the door, and there you have the four partners of Paradise Alley. I want to ask you a question before we get into Paradise Alley. You were talking about uh, you being leased out to various independents every now Were you leased out to the Savoldis at one point? Yeah. Yeah, I was. Uh, uh-huh. For television, did they? Was it a television? Uh, I, I'm not sure. That was the fallout with Tony Altamar. Okay. Um, because he was going up there, and mm-hmm. I didn't want to. I didn't want to go. But I knew the only reason why he was taking me is because he would fall asleep driving because it was up in Maine. <laughs> so I told him I would go only if he would call Savoldi. And tell him I'm not doing any jobs. So he said, okay. So we got up there on the first night. And Savoldi came up to me and said, will you do a job for Iron Mike Sharp? I said, absolutely. <laughs> Without a doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll do a job for him. I don't have a problem with that. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. I go, no, no, no. I said, listen, we're going to tear down the house. We tore down the house in the WWF. We're going to tear down the house. And we did. And then the next night, I worked with Sonny Blades. I remember and, him. And I ended up and I I worked with him. I was 23. He was 18. And he's I'm like, thanks. I, I went over on him with a sidewalk slam and I said, You okay? He goes, Yeah, yeah. And then he goes, um, I'm feeling pretty good. I broke my back. Uh I go, You what? <laughs> and now he tells me he broke his back. Then he's like, Then oh my mother passed away. Your mother passed away. You know, so at the end of the night, I said, hey, hey, you want to go to TV? He goes, what? I go, do you want to go to the WWF? I'll take you there. Hmm. And, he, and he said, yeah. And I came walking in with him. Strongbow goes, who's this? I go, I work with him, Chief. He's fine. He goes, all right, get dressed. So Sonny did a small stint. But then he became friends with Terry Garvin. And Garvin offered him an old ring in the warehouse. And Sonny took that ring and he made a hell of a living renting renting it out around the country. He just worked with that ring and did pretty well for himself. So 
I read recently he opened up a wrestling school, wherever the hell he is now, under his shoot name. I don't remember what the hell it is. Uh, Sonny, Sonny Blaze. Yeah, there was a... Yeah, I think his name was Al something, if I remember correctly. No? I, I don't know, but, it, it, you know, last I heard, he was in Florida. That maybe that's where it was, yeah. I think last year, I think because... Uh, if you remember John Arezzi, like he he was part of John Arezzi's radio show back in the day, and uh, uh, I think on, they they bring back the old episodes and they post them online. And I was listening to when they were and they would give commentary and they were saying what he's doing now, you know, basically that he runs that he uh, runs a promote or not a promotion but a school. Yeah, maybe it was Florida. I just couldn't remember where. Yeah. It was 2014. At that point in my life, it was starting to get a little rough mm -hmm. um unfortunately my marriage was winding down um we were drifting farther apart i was having some professional problems at work and it seemed like everywhere i turned you know i was looking the grim reaper in the face so my best friend on the face of this earth is big steve tracy who worked as dave paradise and he called me up and he said um and he's very blunt. He doesn't pull any punches. So he's like, you know, you got nothing going for you. I go, I realize this. He goes, you, you, I rock bottom. I go, this I realize. He goes, you know, you should go back to something that you really love. And I'm like, what's that? And he's like, what do you mean? It's wrestling. And I said, well, I'm kind of an old man now for that. You know what I mean? He goes, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I open up a wrestling school. I said, well, I got a problem. I don't have a ring and I don't have a building. And he goes, well, let me work on that. I said, okay. And he found a building and he bought a ring. And um, he said, why don't you see if Roma wants to come in? So I text Roma. I said, hey, Roma, I'm opening up a wrestling school in East Haven. Are you in? And he just typed Y-E-P. And I said, are you sure you're in? And he typed again, Y-E-P. So I got, I, I called Big Steve back. I go, Roma's in. <laughs> and he goes, okay. And, um, you know, we were looking for a place. We found it on um, Co Avenue. And um, we opened up, you know, Holiday was the first student and only student. And we started teaching Holiday, and then slowly, you know, HOP walked in, um, Matias walked in. Uh, you know, these guys already knew how to work, but with me and Roma, um, you know, we, we sharpened them up. You know, what I mean? mm -hmm. so it's like I remember the first time I locked up with Matias, and I said, get me in a headlock. And he grabbed my head with two hands. And I said, what? What? What are you doing? You know, so it was just a matter of sharpening, you know, smoothing out the edges because they already were pretty good. You know, and, you know, I, I um, we, we started there and then we, we ran our, first, I think our first show was September 12th. Uh, 2015 at Melillo, and I got on the phone with um, Tony Alice and Tito Santana. I, I brought them in. Yeah, I started calling my friends, you know, and um, and here we are. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's um. What was it like? Did you, when Holiday came in? You know, um, did you? see that he was going to be, you know, going to places where he's going. I looked him dead in the face and said, you're going to go far mm -hmm. because he reminded me of the guys from the eighties, you know, like at six foot two, six foot three, two forty five. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, I, and don't get me wrong. God bless, you know, flash Waller. He's an excellent worker. Mm -hmm. Can't take that away from him. The guy's a good entertainer, you know, but you know, I don't know. If he's a buck forty five or a buck fifty, is he know, is he that much? I I've always know. said I don't know. I've always said he know. needs to 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 eat a steak or something. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah he, a few pounds. A, he is a hell of a worker. I go. I guess he couldn't be flash if he couldn't if he was heavier. So but there you go. <laughs> um, you know, I believe the same thing about King Kai. I believe that you know he's, you know, 
he's coming along well. He's he, he reminds me kind of a rockish kind of guy. You know what I mean? If his body fills out more and everything, he's he's very promising. Um, but Holiday is probably the biggest alter ego. Um, aside from the one man gang. Um, because when gang wasn't working, you know, he had these glasses and he, when he didn't have his glasses on, he was okay. You like this. And he was kind of a quiet guy, kind of just, you know, kind of like that, that, uh, gentle giant that didn't speak much in high school, just sat there with mm-hmm. his glasses and, um, but holidays, one of the biggest alter egos i've seen i mean he he came in he was nervous you know he, he you know he came in he had those those coke bottle glasses on his eyes bugging out of his head and, and, and everything and um uh you know and he developed this persona of richard holiday he's just a completely different person when that when he goes through that curtain there is no trust me when i tell you there are no signs of of joe Zimbardi when he walks through those curtains none <laughs> It's all Richard Holiday. Wow. Tell me about some of the students you have now that, um, you know, I think there's a breed of students, or the class, I should say, of students. Some of these kids are really, really good. Like you mentioned Carlon King and Flash Waller. Uh, Flash style might not necessarily be the style that I prefer, but I think he is very good for what he does, you know? And I think that the, the two of them really have potential to be going, you know, well, Sorry. like I say, but what Kylon, Kylon is a very talented guy, and and you know he's going to be very good at cutting promos, and he's very good, uh, you know, uh, with his voice and and the way he he performs, and mm-hmm. his wrestling skills are really really good, and um, like I said, if he starts filling out more. Um, you know he's he's got a legitimate shot. Um, a holiday's on his way. Uh, the WWE knows of him, and, but mm-hmm. they also they also know of his contract. Right. Nice. So I you know I think his next move is there uh, to the WWE. I think it's a huge gimmick. I think he he created a huge gimmick. He's a social media monster. Like he is on there constantly promoting his character. Yeah. And I, th- and I think that helps him a lot. You know what I mean? When he's not wrestling, he's doing the character on social media and it works. Well, he is he is the new breed of see, I'm a wrestler. I'll always just be a wrestler. I'm just a wrestler. Mm. Rick Valentine will just be a wrestler. Um, Holiday's a performer. <laughs> and he's the new breed. He's the 2021. Um, you know, I got to do something to market myself. I have to do something, you know, to brand myself. You know, mm-hmm. and um, he did a good job of it. In fact, I walked away from him in, uh, one time. And I said, just don't even talk to me. I said, you know, I'm. Uh, you're going to be a wrestler. He's like, I'm. I'm, I'm going to be a, a, a performer. I said, no, you're a wrestler. He goes, no, no, no. That's not what I'm in this for. And I'm like, I don't talk to me. <laughs> Get away from me. <laughs> so, um, but he he is a, a, a very good wrestler, and um, but his marketing. What he made himself, his gimmick. Um, you know, I even did his intro to the WWE. I, I thought it was tremendous. I said, you know, I can see Triple H walking down the hallway and you're sitting with, with your foot up on your knee with a Wall Street Journal in front of your face. And Triple H just stops in his tracks and he looks down and he pushes the new newspaper down and goes... Who the hell are you? <laughs> and he goes, I'm Richard Holiday. I'm the most marketable man in professional wrestling. And there it starts. And, you know, with the the, the AirPod and, um, 
you know, one show, I went to Dollar General and I bought a $10 pair of AirPods. And I said, I want to see something. I want you to wear these instead of the real thing. And I want you to ask the fans who wants them. And the place went ballistic. I think I was there for that. <laughs> ballistic. They went yeah. ballistic. And it worked. Um, he's a good person. He's a good kid. And he gets the business fully now. And he's a consummate professional. So I don't see anywhere up but up anywhere but up for him. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, King. I see a lot of, of promise in. Um, the Haven are a really good tag team. Mm-hmm. We're sure a couple inches taller. Uh, but they're a good yeah. tag team. Yeah. They're, they're a good tag team. So you got guys like me and uh, Moore's off and, um, and Bull Dread, you know, to, to and, and Chris Battle mm-hmm. to, you know, keep things level headed, you know what I mean, with these young kids. I lost one on August 24th. He was there every Monday night, Big Jim. And um, we're still devastated from that. And uh, I, I'm sorry that, you know, I had to call Big Daddy like a lunatic on that night. Um, just you know, happened to be on your show. That it's, You know, that's okay. Because I, I felt really bad after because I knew you, you were trying. And, you know, we thought it was just Diesel Mania. Was it Diesel? No, I mean, uh, Rumble was that Saturday. So we were just like, uh, we didn't think it was anything... But then he said, I'll call you right back. And I was like, uh, you know, and then uh, we never said it on air. You know what I mean? But he he texted it to me and I was like, oh, my God. You know, I had just spoken with him myself just a couple of days prior. And, uh, you know, it's it's he was such a great, great gentleman. He really he was. was. He and was. I've, you know, he, he, he plopped himself next to me the night before he died. And he looked at me, he goes, six man tag, diesel mania. I said, we're finally going to work together. He goes, yeah, after five years, I finally get to work with you. I said, well, just make sure we both get tagged in at the same time. You know, and he goes, what are we going to do? I go, old school, man, not telling you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you when we get in there. We're not call- I'm not calling anything outside the ring, just the finish. I just want to know what the finish is. I'll do everything in there, just like we used to do back in the WWF. Even at house show, you know, you knew what the finish was. Or if you didn't, you got the finish. And then it was like, yeah, see you out there. You know, n- n- you know, you, nothing was, you know, oh, we're going to lock up. I'm going to grab you in an arm bar. Then I want you to flip and reverse it. I'm like, nothing, like, <laughs> not, not even close. Um, and he just kind of laughed when I said, we're, I'm going to call it out there. Don't worry about it. And he just kind of laughed. You know, he went in and did his front rolls and he was hitting the ropes hitting the turnbuckles, trying to do an up and over. 300 pounds, he's doing up and over. Um, And he seemed fine. He was happy. You know, it was hard for Jim to be happy at times. He was happy. Um, He was happy in his relationship. He was happy with his job. He was happy with the company. And... um, We, thank God, it was my daughter's my daughter turned 26 on August 24th, and we, we, it was about an hour after we got done with the case. We were just sitting there, and, and um, Roma called me, and he said, are, are you sitting down? I said, as a matter of fact, I am, yeah. He goes, no, Mario, listen to me. This is because Jim was my guy. Everybody knew Jim was my guy. So he goes, this is going to hit you really hard. He goes, it's not going to be easy, okay? I go, just tell me, Roman. He said, Big Jim's dead. And, I, you know, it was that, it was that center ring show in 2016 um, when I'm watching a clip and I go, that guy's pretty big. And Fog goes, he's, he's not even trained. And what do you need, mean he's not trained? He's, not, he's never been trained. I go, then you shouldn't be in a ring. So the clip was over. I made a plea to the camera. I said, Big Jim, come down to Paradise Alley. We will teach you. 
And then after the show was over, he said, you know, he dates Jade. And I taught Jade from start to finish. You know, um, she was too afraid of Roma. <laughs> so I trained her from start to finish. And um, so I said, get your boyfriend down to the school on Monday. And he came walking through. And, you know, he's been there ever since. And um, we're going to miss him. Um, you know, he was my guy. All the guys knew they were my, he was my guy. Um, even when he got some heat within the company, they'd say to, them, so, to, to each other, we can't do anything because that's Mara's guy. You know? So, um, you know, I'm going to miss him. He, uh, he was on the right path. I, I wish I knew what happened. There's um, nothing that came out yet? No? No, there were n never any services or anything. Okay. Uh, no news about the autopsy or anything. Nothing. So, kind of a bummer. Yeah, that's, um, you guys did a beautiful tribute to him at uh, Rumble in Paradise. Yeah, th yeah, thank you. It was very emotional, and, uh, well, shit, I got all teary-eyed during, uh, during your speech. Yeah. So, you know, uh, he's definitely uh, going to be missed. He was, uh, like I said, a phenomenal human being. And I've always uh, said this. He was one to, if he sees you in the crowd, he's going to work his way through the crowd to make sure to shake your hand, say hello, right. and see the, how you're doing and stuff like that. And just right. at least say, uh, to, you know, that, that's just the guy he was. So, yeah, he was. Yeah. So what else would you like to uh, talk about tonight? I, well, you know, we have Diesel Mania coming up on um, September 25th. That's to, uh, you know, that goes to the uh, to support the Michael J. D'Angelo Sports Scholarship Fund. Um, again, this was, like I say, I give credit where credit's due. Um, Michael J. D'Angelo was a tri-captain in East Haven, East Haven High School. A very popular kid. He was called Diesel because of the size of his legs. Um, his mother and father called him Diesel. Um, so, unfortunately, he passed away in a car accident at the age of 19 years old. Uh, and the town was devastated. Needless to say, his parents. It was one of the referees, Dave Olson, who said, you know, do you know the kid that passed away in a car accident? I said, no. He goes, yeah, yeah, pretty popular in the town. Parents are popular. I said, I'll look into it. And um, I talked to Big Steve, and I mentioned it to him. He goes, I'm very good friends with Johnny D'Angelo. He goes, um, that's a good idea. So he got a hold of John, and he said, listen, we want to put a benefit show on for your kid. And, you know, donate it to the scholarship fund, you know. And... Um, so we did the first Diesel Mania, and um, and they've they've gone well. The only thing after that was my phone started ringing off the hook with charities, and we started our company from 2016 until probably the middle of 2019 or the end was known for straight charity shows. Mm -hmm. Um, we did Diesel Mania, Camp Rising Sun. We did a, a fundraiser for the the Malillo Middle School Glee Club, uh, the Branford Animal Shelter, the East Haven Animal Shelter. Um, you know, we're on November thirteenth. We're we're doing um, Type One to None Juvenile Diabetes, um, and we were known for doing the, doing the charities we did the autism show that everybody knows what that got screwed up with that mm -hmm. um, you know and roma because i take care of the business roma takes care of the talent and the production and i take care of the business and roma just at one point just <laughs> he looked at me and said mario and you know this is my brother for 37 years and he goes, I love you. Your heart's in the right place. We're going to have to close. Because when we don't have any students coming through the door, we need to make the rent with the shows. And we can't because you give the whole gate to the charity. So uh, Mario didn't do the portion of the proceeds. 
they were the higher proceeds. Oh, wow. and and I would pay the talent with what we sold for hamburgers and hot dogs, or and if we were short, I dug in my pocket. So finally, he pleaded with me and said, "We just can't do it anymore. We can't." So we do diesel mania, and we do type one to none. Um, we do those two charities a year, and um, even at that, you know, n- now I. You know, I'm bold enough to say, hey, you know, I, I need the payroll and you can have the rest. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, you know, there, there are some issues, unfortunately, um, you know, because CJ is is our hardest working sp- um, charity. Our hardest, for example. Um, the Middletown baseball team called me. Uh-huh. And wanted to put on a show in Middletown to to benefit the Middletown baseball team, and we had about sixty three people there. And I went up to the baseball coach and I go, because I dropped a hundred tickets off there, and you figured everybody in the team if they sold five tickets a piece, you know. So I go, did the players sell any tickets? They're like, not one. Okay. Did it's they for try? their benefit and they didn't sell <laughs> one ticket. No. DJ is completely the opposite. He'll put 300 people in there. The only snag we have now is that at the JCC, the limit's 140. Mm-hmm. So, unless I can call there by November 13th and they loosened up and can say 175 or 200, because CJ will put their butts in those seats. Mm-hmm. And uh, he really goes above and beyond. And he's there for every show with his camera, taking shots of the guy. I see him. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, he's a part of the Paradise Alley family. Um, and very shortly, I'm going to induct you into the Paradise Alley family. Grabbing a mic with uh, Big Daddy. Big Daddy and I are working on that now to pick the show you're going to do that with. So, I'm excited. Uh, yeah, so... Um, yeah, Thank I'm, you. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so, Diesel Mania is the 25th, and then we have a show. We have a very busy October. I, I'm not going to be able to breathe in October. <laughs> so, October 8th, I'm supposed to go to Test the Strength. Um, they're booking most of my guys, and they're going to do a tribute to B- Big Jim. I'm really not sure if I'm going yet. I got to see what my daughter's doing. But October 13th, we have the JCC. And okay. October 23rd, we have the Taco Fest in Old Orchard Beach, Maine. And then October 30th, we have the Taco Fest in Hartford. Um, and then, oh, and, and those are unique shows. Because mm-hmm. we run the show from 12 to 6. So, like, we put a match out every half hour. Yeah. So, oh, that's the one, the last one in North Haven, and it was match, and then a break for a half hour, then match. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Then on November thirteenth, um, we have type one to none, and then we, I think it's December eighteenth, if I'm correct. Uh, and then we start back up in January because I I have a deal with the JCC for the rest of 2021 and with the exception of July and August, uh, all of 2000, 10 months in 2022. Okay. Um, so we got a lot going on. I, I was blessed enough to cut a deal with fight TV. Um, that was nice. Um, and I'm very appreciative to fight TV and let's hope those numbers get bigger. And, um, you know, just doing some, just doing some good stuff. I think the fight uh, numbers are going to grow. Just, yeah. you know, push it out there. You know, push out the content. You know, you had one show so far, so I'm sure it'll get bigger and grow. Yeah, I'm hoping. Uh, you know what I mean? As long as people are, you get the talent is out there pushing it and promoting it. it you know, that's that's the key behind everything nowadays. Right, just, right, uh, uh, right. Pushing, so. Well, I'm very glad that you joined me today and that we finally got to get this uh, this done. And I want to invite you back uh, sometime in the near future. Listen, anytime you need me, I'll be here. Especially to promote your next big event on fight. Yeah, not a, yeah, that will be Diesel Mania. Um, we'll be on Fight TV, but 
you know, I trust my guys. Williams is a big part of my company. He's the booker. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had Williams get in touch with Fight TV, and he called me back, and he said, Mario, I think the smartest thing to do is to tape it Mm -hmm. and then give it to Fight TV on a weekend that they're not too busy and then air it on Fight in in a delay. So we're going to do that because, you know, when I spoke to Fight TV, they said, don't be down. You did good. You were up against 17 other pay-per-views, one of which was an all-women's wrestling match. Does the NWA show is the same thing? Uh, right. Yeah. 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 So we're it's gonna be it's gonna be for Fight TV, but it's gonna be delayed. Um, so we're gonna try to do that with most of the shows, and as long as Fight TV will have us, and um, and hopefully that works out. All right. Cool. Well, do you want to give out any uh, contact, social media, anything like that? Well, Paradise Alley, uh, professionalwrestling.com. Um, you can find us on Twitter. You can you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. Wrestling School. If you know, as the old saying used to used to be, if you feel like you're tough enough, um, we're at six six two Co Avenue, Unit Two in East Haven. Uh, come on down if you're interested in being a professional wrestler, a manager, or referee. Um, and of course, I, I you know I I. I want to give a shout out to uh, to uh, Big Daddy. Um, you know he's on Facebook uh, as Jay Brony, and he's on he's also on Twitter. Um, you know, so he is one of the hardest working people as far as promoting anything that I've ever seen. He he'll literally do it for ten hours. Um, you know, he he's an extreme talent. He's excellent at what he does on the mic. And um, he is also a very dedicated company guy. Um, it's all Paradise Alley, and he works hard on doing it. And I couldn't be more grateful to have somebody behind my company like uh, Big Daddy. So, um, you know, you want to check out Big Daddy. And... It, it, and he's got a lot of stuff you can watch, which, you, you know, you'll enjoy. You know? He's worked with everybody, you know. Yeah, he, past yeah. He's, listen, yeah. Big Daddy has worked with 90% of the people I've worked with. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He's worked with Bundy. You know, he's worked with with Terry Funk and the Samoans. And he, he's, you know, he's worked with a, a, a lot of guys that I worked with when I was in the WWF. He worked with them when they got out. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, he's been in the wrestling business for 30 years as a manager. And, um, you know, we're, we're I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a guy like that as a part of my company because he does work so hard um, to to get the Paradise Alley word out there. Um, and he does it. He does it. He's dedicated to it and he does it a long time. So I appreciate that from Big Daddy. Okay, so I want to thank you again. And then, you know, Big Daddy is always a guest here, and I'm sure he's going to be coming back on again, especially when you guys got a big event coming on, coming yeah, up. Yeah, he's so. the man. Big Daddy is the man. All right, thanks again, Mario. Thanks, Rick. Not a problem.